Dr. Galaburda is the Emily Fisher Lando Professor of Neurology and Neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. He's a practice, practicing cognitive neurologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and co-director of the Mind-Brain Behavior Interfaculty Initiative of Harvard University. Dr. Galaburda received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Boston University and trained in medicine under Norman Levinsky and in neuro neurology under Norman Geshwin, both at the then Boston City Hospital, now Boston Medical Center. He received board certification in internal medicine in 1976 and in neurology in 1977. His clinical and research expertise is in the field of cognitive neurology with a special focus on learning and attention disorders. Dr. Galaberta's research explores the brain underpinnings of language and language-based learning disabilities. His earlier work focused on structural manifestations and the development of cerebral asymmetries, as well as on the neuroanatomical organization of the auditory system in primates, including humans. His current research, which has evolved over the past two decades, looks at the brain basis of developmental dyslexia within a multidisciplinary research program that includes genetics, cell and molecular biology, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuroimaging, and behavior in animal models of abnormal development of the cerebral cortex. Dr. Galaberta has had uninterrupted funding from the NIH since 1981. He's published over 180 scientific articles and several books and has received many prizes and honors for his contributions to medical knowledge. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Albert Galaberta. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's really an honor for me to be here because you're the people who actually take care of the children that scare me. <laughs> There's a movement in medicine about translational research, you know, and this has started in the past five to ten years. You know, for most of my career in research, which was at the bench, meaning, you know, no contact with human beings, just mice and tissues on dishes and things like that, we had no, we felt no pressure to make our research translatable into practice. That was down the line because we knew it took many years for us to know enough about something so that we can then think of treatment. But you know, uh, what changed this uh, was the HIV epidemic where thousands of people were dying and we didn't have anything for them and suddenly the FDA was willing to approve drugs more quickly so that uh, without going through all this excruciating testing that uh, took years and years and years to try to save life. And at the beginning, the drugs that were introduced were pretty toxic, probably helped some people along in dying. Eventually, you know, the drugs today are magnificent. Now, uh, I say this not because I think dyslexia is a disease uh, in the same sense that HIV is a disease, but it is a challenge. Uh, not just to educators, uh, not just to our society, but also to uh, biomedical researchers. Because uh, as with everything else, uh, when you study a condition, you learn a lot about other conditions. Uh, you learn a lot about uh, the machinery that makes us human. So I, I just want to bring this at the forefront of my talk because in the end uh, it is you who uh, have to be inspired to try new things with your students. It's, a, it's been an explosion of knowledge and in the first uh, 30 years since 1950 there were 1500 papers or so published on dyslexia. Most of them were in acquired dyslexia by the way which uh, in the UK, applies to the word dyslexia applies to acquired and the developmental dyslexia. Acquired dyslexia has to do with strokes mostly. Uh, people who are, know how to read and then have a stroke in a particular part of the brain and then lose the ability to read. So most of those papers were about that. 
Now, from 1980 until now, there have been almost 8,000 papers. You can imagine the explosion of interest. And I think in part, this, uh, this interest came about as a result of dyslexia expanding beyond its being an educational concern to its becoming a biological concern too. What happened 35 years ago? Something that is very relevant to your work is that Bradley and Bryant started to talk about dyslexia as a phonological problem. At that time, a phonological problem explained the understanding of the sound structure of the language. Since then, phonology has acquired more than just that meaning. It has several levels of processing, and we'll talk more about that later. 